Oh, there he is. Hey, can you hear us? I can hear you. Great, so you have the entire group here. Turn you around here. All right. Welcome, Larry. So, uh, I'm looking at the ceiling, which is... <laughs> there. So there we go. Can you see everybody? Right. Full screen. Hang on. I'll get you set Perfect. All right, Larry. Go ahead. So I, uh, I'm really kind of sad. I'm not there because I'm beginning to think this is the most important moment in the history of the revolution that began. Well, let's say it began today, um, because. I believe the essential thing to make this revolution possible, this rebellion possible, is technology. It's people and technology, but technology is going to be a core part. And the problem is that we need to think about next generation technology that brings people into this process who have not been in the context of, have not been involved in politics before. Um, we can't afford that. We can't afford that in the old fashioned way in which people go out and buy it from the best firms. So we've had to recruit um, people who have been inspired with the idea, and that is what I hope we've got in SCADs, looks like about 50, maybe more people there uh, this weekend. So uh, what I'm really hoping is that through the interaction of you looking at what we've begun to say we need and telling us what's good and what's bad and helping to build out what, uh, what, we've, begun to, uh, what we've begun to sketch out as what we need, we can really produce something that can begin to mobilize enough people so that the political process takes this, for ser takes this seriously. Um, because right now they think the other way politics happens is if a Democratic Party or a Republican Party approves it. And we've got to show them that there's a kind of politics that isn't about the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, but is about the citizens deciding they have the power and are going to exercise the power to fix their government. Um, so I, I'm grateful, really grateful that you're there doing that. Uh, and um, I'm happy, Jeff, do you want me to take some questions or I'm happy to do whatever you, Jeff is the boss, do you tell me I need? <laughs> well, did you want to go ahead and pitch the few projects that we were thinking of? Because we, we're going to go ahead and have a couple people pitch a few other projects, but uh, I think a lot of folks are interested in the projects that we're interested in building for New Hampshire. And then we can right, go ahead so, and do some Q&A. Great, so, what, so in New Hampshire, We've identified New Hampshire as an obvious um, uh, opportunity to begin to change the presidential campaign in 2016. Um, if New Hampshire citizens begin to make this corruption of the system the central issue for them in that campaign, politicians will respond to that. And you'll see politicians, I, I think cert certainly in the Republican Party, and hopefully in the Democratic Party, um, begin to talk about corruption as a central issue and, and begin to identify what they want to do about it. So the New Hampshire rebellion is, um, is a rebellion against the politicians. We're not, you know, throwing off the government. We're rebelling against the politicians in the sense we want to say to them, um, look, we want you to focus for a minute on this question that we care about. Um, you know, we're happy to listen to your rain dance about how you're going to make jobs work or inflation go away or the debt disappear. But the really important thing we want you to address first is how are you going to fix the system of corruption in Washington? Um, now, to mobilize people to do that, we've begun to think about the kind of tools that will make that possible. Um, and those tools can be broken down in a couple of steps. Uh, one tool um, um, is a tool for organizing people to go out and ask candidates at candidate events this number one question that we think is central, which is, how are you going to address the system of corruption in Washington? So to organize people to do that, we've got a couple of steps. Number one, we've got to find have a simple way for people to begin to identify candidate events. So, um, you know, Ron Paul, Rand Paul is going to be at so-and-so uh, on such and such date talking about whatever. Um, and then Another bit of that enables people to say, okay, I, I'm going to volunteer to go there. Who wants to be there with me? Um, and uh, somebody can indicate, I'm going to be asking the question, what are you going to do to end the system of corruption in Washington? And we need people to videotape those events so somebody can say, I volunteer to be the videographer at that event. 
And then once that event happens, people need to upload the videos so that we can begin to catalog and track where people are in uh, answering this question that we hope they will get every single time they open their mouth in New Hampshire. So that's, the, that's a tool around organizing the actual asking of this question and creating pressure from what the answers are. Um, uh, in addition to that, um, uh, the way we recruit people into the um, New Hampshire Rebellion is through acts like these marches. We've done one of them, which I'm sure Jeff, if he has it, will tell you about, where we walked 185 miles across New Hampshire in January, beginning on the uh, anniversary of Aaron Swartz's death and ending on the anniversary of Granny Dee's birth, a woman who walked at the age of 90 across the whole United States in the name of campaign finance reform. Um, so we're going to do a bunch of those marches, uh, some in January, in July, we're going to do another one next January, and we're going to certainly do another one in the January of the primary in 2016. Um, we've got technology that we need around organizing and enable those, enabling those, which, um, um, which I'm sure Jeff will also talk about. Uh, and then finally, a critical part of this process is, you know, we can think about it in the stage of education, um, we are recruiting people to come into the state to, to speak at, think of it as kind of speaker's bureau, speak at these different events around the states to talk to people and convince them to join the rebellion. And in that speaking process, we want people walking out of those events committed to holding their own house party where they get their five or ten uh, best friends to sit down and talk about this issue and how to spread this issue. This is a strategy which... Governor Dean used in the 2004 campaign, and they organized more than 4,000 house parties across the state of New Hampshire, which if we can just get half of those, we will produce an enormous uh, effect on that 2016 primary. So all of these are, you know, activities need, and you know, critically need uh, a technology platform to make them work. Um, and so what we're hopeful is that out of this weekend, we could begin to get the elements of that put together so that we can we can, uh, we can deploy it in a way that, that will make um, the work of the New Hampshire Rebellion effective. Is there more you wanted me to hit, uh, Jeff? Or no, is that's that... great. We actually have, I have further descriptions of each of those projects, so everybody can, can take a look at that. But that's great for a great you know, uh, overview. Um, I thought maybe we might do a little Q&A. We do have about, I guess, 70 folks in the room. Um, so if anybody has any question, uh, oh, we've got a couple. Uh, let's go in the back of the room. Hi there, Austin Lee. Does uh, he need the mic? Do I need a mic? I can't hear. Yeah, we'll move to the back. Hi there, uh, my name is Austin Lee. Uh, there was an interesting point where they were doing a little poll um, in an intro slide, and there were a lot of potential solutions. And somebody asked, can you walk through those? And he said, actually, there's a lot. It's kind of complicated. There's a lot of different ways we can attack it. Um, and then he talked about a poll that you guys did with the 96% of people think it's a problem, but 91% of people don't know how we would fix it. And so I'm kind of wondering what your current thoughts are on, you know, is it still, do we need to think, try to go broad spectrum, or is there, I mean, it looks like New Hampshire's kind of targeting, but just interested in what your current thoughts are on all this. Yeah, that's critical. Um, the more I think about this, the more I'm convinced the only way we can make this movement successful is if we build a credible non-politician movement. Um, the reason for that is, uh, you know, the, you have those two numbers. I want to add a third. So, 96% leave it important to reduce the influence of money in politics. 91% don't think it's possible. And one of the reasons 91% don't think it's possible is, according to the Claris Group in a poll they conducted in July of 2012, 80% of Americans believe every single reform Congress has passed. It is passed for the purpose of benefiting itself, not for the purpose of changing the system. So we are so deeply cynical about Congress that we think no matter what they do, no matter what they say, they're just doing it to benefit themselves. So that's why I think it's really essential that we build a credibly non-politician movement to force them to bring about the kind of changes we believe they need to bring about. So that people can look at it and they don't have a reason to believe we're just in this for ourselves. Like, we're not running for anything. We're not politician wannabe. Um, we're just citizens who are tired of a government that fails, either fails for the right or fails for the left. Um, so 
What's, that's why what we're doing or what you're doing, I think, is ultimately going to be so critical because what you're doing is not going to become a tool of the Democratic Party or a tool of the Republican Party. Um, it is an outsider political movement, right? I, in another talk I uh, recently gave, we were talking about, you know, everybody thinks the interesting division in American politics is between the, the right side and the left side. But the important division in American politics is between the inside and the outside. And if you think of the outside as a kind of as uh, Nigel Cameron describes it, the exo-political movements, the kind of outsider's political movement, that's what we have to build. Because if we build a credible and powerful and well-funded and well-organized and technology-savvy exo-political movement, that has the power to begin to push the people on the inside to change the system. Now, there are a lot of parts to that movement. Um, there's a presidential part, that's what the New Hampshire Rebellion is about. There's a... Um, there is a uh, critical congressional part. Uh, I don't know if John, is John there? He is. Yeah. Great, so there's John. Um, so John Phillips um, has been working on a really important project, which I hope he's gonna get a chance to pitch as well, um, to make it possible for us to get congressional candidates and members of Congress to commit to fundamental reform. So on the site that he's built, Basically, if you've committed to fundamental reform, meaning you've promised to co-sponsor a list of four reforms that we've identified, um, co-sponsor any of those four, two of them are Republican proposals, two are Democratic, then on your icon you get an AC for against corruption or anti-corruption, and if you don't have an AC, then you have a DC, so you're either AC or DC, um, uh, and that's to emphasize this kind of insider-outsider perspective. Like, we on the outside are demanding that they commit themselves to changing the system. Um, so that's about changing Congress. And then a completely different political movement, which uh, Jeff has been part of um, and I've been part of, uh, is the, you know, the movement to, to bring about an Article Five constitutional convention, uh, which would be a kind of outsider's movement to force them to uh, give somebody other than Congress a shot at describing amendments or proposing amendments to the Constitution. You know, we've got to be able to do all of these things at the same time. Um, and, that's, and that's what we've been, uh, that's, you know, that's obviously hard to organize at the same time, but we've been pushing in every single context all of these at the same time. All of them are about something other than insider Democrats and insider Republicans. Um, and I really think it's essential. This is the essential movement, and, and what, what you guys are doing is, is an important contribution to that. Great, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Full hands. Thanks for joining us, Professor Lessig. Uh, do you think that with three to four trillion dollars being spent in DC every year, in each year's budget, that even if we elected, even if we had clean campaigns, that the electeds would be able to stay clean when lobbyists were trying to direct some of that three to four trillion dollars towards their firms during the session? I mean, isn't part of the problem that they're allocating so much money? That's the end of my question. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think libertarians have a, you know, a strong, a compelling argument that one of the reasons for all this corruption is the government's trying to do too much. Um, you know, if you look at the first part of America's history, the kind of period up to before the Civil War, there wasn't this kind of corruption at the federal government level, largely because there was not much at the federal government going on. And where the federal government tried to do a lot of things, like, you know, run tariffs, that's where there was corruption. So if you look at, you know, you could say as a libertarian, the biggest objective we should try to have is to shrink the size of government. Now, I understand that position. It's not my position, but I understand it. It's intellectually quite credible. But even if that's what you think we have to do, I think the point that I've been trying to make is you won't have any shot at doing that until we change the way we fund elections. Because right now, the way we fund elections um, benefits from a large and invasive government. The more the government regulates, the more there are targets for their as uh, 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 Peter Schweitzer puts it, their extortion, their extortion as they turn around and they say to the people they're regulating or people who depend upon the government, look, if you don't help us, we're not gonna be able to help you. So the only way to create a government or a Congress that's actually free to choose to be libertarian um, is if that Congress doesn't know that that choice makes it impossible for it to raise money. 
give it a different way to raise its money to fund its campaigns, and then it gets to decide, do we want a government this big or a government doing all sorts of things? And you know, there are all sorts of places where I think people on the left and people on the right could certainly get together about shrinking the size of the federal government. So number one, um, Cato Institute publishes a report every year of, quote, corporate welfare. This is money which the federal government indirectly or directly gives to corporations to protect them from the effects of the market, which have no public justification. It's purely private justification. There's no reason liberals and conservatives or libertarians and liberals couldn't get together on eliminating that. Um, uh, uh, you know, um, David Stockman um, uh, came to Harvard and we did this workshop where he put together five um, ideas which liberals and libertarians could agree on. Uh, uh, right at the top of that list was the federal budget, uh, the federal defense budget, which um, libertarians and liberals should have no uh, difficulty in agreeing is wildly too big given the role of the United States, the proper role in the United States. Um, so there's lots of places where we could be shrinking the government, and I think that would be an important debate to have, but we can only have that debate once we've removed the system of corruption from the way we fund elections. Great. Let's go ahead and take one more question. Hey, hey, thanks for joining us this, uh, this morning. Um, my question is, what's the difference between a special interest and a sufficiently large movement? Or put another way, once, once this movement gets large enough, how are we going to prevent uh, ourselves from falling for the same tactics that we're fighting against? Because those tactics are the only way that politics currently works. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, if we're successful, what that means is that the power in the political system will depend on which, which side can get the most number of people to exercise their uh, franchise individually, where their franchise is both their vote at a voting booth and in my view, their franchise as in a contribution, I'd like everybody to have a voucher which they use to contribute campaigns. But the point is, the people who win are the people who get the most number of people to exercise their power in the way in which they want that power exercised. Now, in that world, you can certainly have special interest legislation. Right? So in that world, if all there was was people exercising their franchise, you could certainly get, you know, um, uh, all the people over the age of 60, um, or ARP thinks that you should be a member when you're 50, which I discovered on my 50th birthday when they sent me an invitation card to join the ARP. It was a little bit insulting, I thought. But um, uh, ARP could get all the older people to get together and say, yeah, we want Congress to exercise its power to benefit us, even though it's screwing the younger generation. That would be special interest legislation. There's nothing to block that under a system of democracy. Except people, you know, the representatives recognizing why it would be a bad thing if that were the case. So nothing in the reforms we're proposing or pushing guarantee us utopia or guarantee us just public interested government. But the point is that whatever the distortion is in a system where you've got to get millions of people to, to join with you in order to achieve some effect in the way government works, that is much less dangerous than a system where you only need to get a couple thousand people to get together to exercise their influence to change the way government works. In the world where you know, 150,000 people fund elections, which is you know, the world we live in today, or if the Supreme Court strikes down aggregate limits on contributions, then it'll be a world where 50,000 people are funding elections. In that world, literally it's just a couple thousand people you've got to get together in order to have sufficient power to force Congress to do one thing or to stop it from doing something else. And my point is that is a much more dangerous, much less likely to be public interested um, Congress than one where you need to get millions to join together. So nothing we're doing is going to make it so the government or democracy is guaranteed to work well. But it will make it possible for democracy to work better than it does right now. Right now it can't work because Members are so dependent on funders, and the funders are such a tiny slice of us that we can't begin to imagine them acting in the public interest as opposed to the interest that makes it possible for them to fund their campaigns. 
Great. Well, Professor Lessig, thank you so much for taking the time. We certainly do appreciate it. Thank you. Great. All right. So I guess we're going to get to work. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just a couple things.